Welcome to Brain and a Vat. We are delighted to be joined by Mylan Engel, and we are going to be talking about knowledge and luck. Mylan, would you like to start with a thought experiment? Sure. Thanks, Mark and Jason. Really happy to be here. So imagine that Dylan is an avid euchre player, and he has a fondness for bowers, and his favorite bower is the Jack of Hearts. And he's so fond of the Jack of Hearts that whenever a Euchre deck is randomly shuffled, he always believes that the top card is the Jack of Hearts. Uh, and so the person shuffles the deck and says, what card, Dylan, what card do you believe is the top card? And he says, Jack of Hearts. I believe it's the Jack of Hearts. They flip over the card and it was the Jack of Hearts. Uh, and a Euchre deck has 32 cards, so there's a one in 32 chance that that it would be the Jack of Hearts. Intuitively, Dylan does not know, did not know that the top card was the Jack of Hearts. It was just a lucky guess, right? Most of the time when his fondness for the Jack of Hearts motivates him to believe that the top card is the Jack of Hearts, he's almost always wrong. So that platitude that knowledge requires more than just true belief goes all the way back to Plato's Theotetus when Socrates asked, what must we add to true judgment to get knowledge? Because Socrates realized that a jury could accidentally arrive at a true belief from hearsay when they don't actually have good evidence of the person's guilt. That lead has led people to think that what, what's wrong in the Dillon case is that he doesn't have any evidence for what card is on the top. You just, it's like wishful thinking that it's the Jack of Hearts. Since the, the intuitive idea is that luck is incompatible with knowledge and Dylan just has a lucky guess, people have thought we have to add justification or evidence of the truth to block luck. So now here's another case. Suppose I'm driving down the highway and I look out into a field and I see the animals in the field very clearly, and they look exactly like sheep. And I form the belief that there are sheep in the field. As it turns out that the animals that I'm looking at are actually poodles that have been groomed to look exactly like sheep. But on the other side of the field, behind a hill, there are some sheep in the field. So my belief that there are sheep in the field is true, but intuitively, I don't know that there are sheep in the field on the basis of looking at poodles. <laughs> Why? Because if the sheep hadn't been on the other side of the hill, I still would have believed there were sheep in the field I, I, because I thought those poodles were sheep. But in this case, I actually am justified in believing that there are poodles in the field. I'm sorry, sheep in the field. That's just what sheep look like. And so it's a typical perceptual belief based on a perceptual experience of what sheep look like. And then I'll just mention, and so again, the only reason my belief is true is that luckily the farmer had let the sheep out of the pen and they were on the backside of the hill. So again, epistemic luck seems to block or preclude knowledge. And I'll just mention one more case because it's really historically significant. It was one of the first cases that Edmund Gettier presented in his famous little article, Is Justified True Belief Knowledge? It was his second case, so I'll call it case two. So in this case, imagine that you have incredibly good evidence that Jones owns a Ford. In fact, you went two days ago with Jones to the dealership when he bought the Ford, in quotation marks. He had arranged with the dealer, he actually was leasing the Ford, but he had arranged with the dealer while you were there to make it look like he was buying the Ford and showed you forged ownership papers. And so uh, you don't know any of this has happened. You've never known him to do anything deceptive. So you're justified in believing that Jones owns a Ford. And since you're justified in believing that Jones owns a Ford, you're also justified in believing that either Jones owns a Ford or Brown is in Barcelona. Brown is an old friend of yours. You've, you've lost touch with Brown. You have no idea where Brown is. 
As it turns out, Jones does not own a Ford, but Brown just happens to be in Barcelona. So your disjunctive belief, either Jones owns a Ford or Brown is in Barcelona is true, but you don't know that because your evidence doesn't give you any evidence about jo uh, uh, Brown's whereabouts. You just have this misleading evidence and you only luckily conjoined it with a true proposition that Brown is in Barcelona. So that was Gettier's original case. And in that case, you see a pattern. You start with a justified false belief. You validly deduce a justified true belief from the justified false belief. But the justified true belief, the justified belief you deduce is only luckily true. It's true for reasons that have nothing to do with your misleading evidence. So in each of these cases, we have a case where the, this, there's a strong intuition that the person lacks knowledge and that what accounts for their lack of knowledge is that their belief is only accidentally or coincidentally or luckily true. So something I'm interested in is whether these beliefs are true. I understand that they're justified. I agree that they're not knowledge, but I wonder whether they're true. Let's just focus on the sheep and the poodle case, right? So I'm standing or I'm driving past a field. I look at the field. I see these sheep-like creatures, which are actually poodles that have been doled up to look like sheep. It's, I'm justified in believing that they're sheep. You're saying that it is also true, my belief, that there are uh, sheep in the field because behind the hill there are actually sheep in the field. But that seems like that 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 seems convenient. It, isn't it the case that it's false that that those animals are sheep? So surely it's how we specify the belief. How descriptively broad is it? So there are sheep in the fields where the field is considered this vast area beyond the hill is one way of describing my belief. But another way is to say, I believe those creatures over there are sheep, and that would be false. So I wonder whether the Kant example goes through. Those are two different beliefs. So you're right. If I point to the poodles and say, those animals are sheep, that belief is false. But if, the, if it's clear from the context that the field means the entire fenced-in closure, and I'm riding along with a passenger in the car, and I say, they're sheep in that field, as long as there are sheep somewhere in that enclosed area, there are sheep in the field. It seems to me that it is indeed true that there are sheep in the field, as long as behind the hill out of sight, there really are sheep in the field. And I would say the same thing about the Gettier case, just its basic propositional logic that a disjunction is true if either one of the disjuncts is true. So if Brown is in Barcelona, then the proposition either Jones owns a Ford or Brown is in Barcelona is true. So I, I, I'm just curious whether this account, so a justified true belief account of knowledge might work for certain types of propositions, but not for other types of propositions. I know that as an epistemologist, you probably want an account that works for all kinds of propositions. So if you have knowledge of a proposition, then we know what that means. That there's a particular account regardless of what that proposition is. But I wonder whether certain types of propositions can be counted as known under justified true belief theory if we specify quite clearly what kind of propositions those are. So one way of specifying it is saying that there are propositions that are de re, so they're about particular objects rather than about descriptions or objects that satisfy descriptions. And they might be I'm not sure what the philosophical term is, but they might point out particular objects rather than de dicto, which means that there's certain objects that satisfy description. So I, I wonder what, whether what's going on here is that de dicto propositions suffer from all these counterexamples, but not de re propositions. Typically, philosophers focus on knowing that P, so they are typically focused on de dicto propositions. Now, of course, Knowing of X that X is such and such, that's a de re proposition. Of course, presumably I could know of that field that there are sheep in it. 
so I could get the same problem, or I could believe of that field that there are sheep in it. That would be day ray, and it would only be luckily luckily true if there happened to be sheep on the other side of the field. So I'm not sure that that would solve the problem, but also really from the standpoint of doing epistemology, as long as there are some cases of justified belief that only luckily turns out to be true and thus falls short of knowledge, the JTB analysis, justified true belief analysis, is not sufficient for knowledge. So I wonder if there's a deliberative exercise that could happen with the person who holds the belief. So if you said to them, why do you believe that there are sheep in the field? He says, I can see those white dots over there close to the road. And if you said to him, I'm going to tell you now that those aren't sheep. They look like sheep, but they're actually the puffed up uh, dogs. Do you still believe that there are sheep in the field? You would probably say, no, I don't. Oh, thank you for telling me that those aren't. So if you could have that exercise, then that would change the belief about the entirety of the field. Of course, it turns out that there really are sheep in the field. They're just behind, behind the hill. And so it seems like there's got to be this connection between the justification and the particular fact. And that what happens is that these things don't seem to line up because the luck element falls in the gap, but only luckily. And our worry is that the justification and the belief aren't tying up in the right ways. Is there a method where you could say these cases, because we all share the intuition that these things are knowledge, is it because if we had the deliberative exercise, it would unravel? First, you with that question, you actually do two things. One, you actually move in the direction of identifying what I think is the correct account of knowledge destroying luck. We'll get to that in a little bit. But you also move in the direction of one of the original attempted solution. And by the way, this problem has come to be known as the Gettier problem because of Edmund Gettier's presenting these original cases. You move in the direction of one of the early attempts at resolving the problem, which is Suppose evidence E is my evidence that justifies me in believing P. A defeater for that evidence is a true proposition, D, such that if it were added to my original evidence, I'd no longer still be justified. And you gave a perfect example of that. If you add to the proposition, oh, but those animals you're looking at are poodles, they're not sheep, I would no longer still be justified in believing that they're sheep in the field. And if you were to say, oh, but those ownership papers that Joan showed you were fakes, I you would no longer be justified in believing that either Jones owns a Ford or Brown is in Barcelona. That was one of the original moves in terms of how to come up with a fourth condition that you add to JTB to resolve the, the problem. But the problem is that among defeasibility theorists, they don't agree on the correct on what the correct account of defeaters are. And depending on which account you use, you get different results in different cases. And since, in my opinion, no one has ever been able to defend full stop an account of defeasibility that the defeasibility account doesn't need. Just to give you, here's an example, a thought experiment. Suppose you have a student that you know really, Tom Gravitt. And Tom in the library, you see him grab a book off the shelf, tuck it under his coat and walk out, stealing the book. It seems that you're justified in believing that Tom stole the book and he, Tom stole the book. But now suppose, unbeknownst to you, that Tom's mother said that Tom wasn't in town the day the book was stolen but Tom has an identical twin, John, of bad repute, who was in town the day the book was stolen. Now, if you were to add that proposition to my original evidence, I would no longer be justified in believing that Tom stole the book. But the way Lehrer and Paxson fill out the rest of the story, it turns out that Tom's mother is a lunatic and she uttered those words in a padded cell in front of no one. And John, she, Tom doesn't have an identical twin brother. Lehrer and Paxson's view is that the deranged ramblings of a, of a lunatic shouldn't prevent him from knowing that Tom stole the book when he clearly saw Tom stole the book. So Lehrer and Paxson formulate 
the definition of a defeater as if E is your evidence for the belief that P, then D is a defeater for that if D is true, if you're completely justified in believing D is false, and if you add D to your original evidence, then you'd no longer be justified. And they claim, but of course, you're not completely justified in believing that Tom's mother didn't say those things because you have no evidence whatsoever about what she did or didn't say. So in their view, you don't have a defeater and thus you know that Tom stole the book. I know the case is complicated, but whereas on the original de account of defeat that I gave you, which is was defended by Roderick Chisholm and Peter Klein, you wouldn't know that Tom stole the book even though you clearly saw it and because the mother said something that she had no idea what she was saying. But the, without going into the details, the Lehrer Paxson view seems to get other cases wrong. And unless we can get a clear account of what the correct version of a defeater is, the defeasibility count doesn't um, look all that promising. My day job is that I'm a lawyer. And so one of the things that you have to do in court is way up bits of evidence. And a court will never tell you, I know X to be true. They're gonna say, based on all the evidence that's before me, I think that I can convict this person beyond a reasonable doubt, or on a balance of probabilities in a civil case, I think the evidence goes 51% this way. And it seems like you wanna be able to weigh up the evidence and you're gonna have a certain credence in that, in that evidence. And as you give the story, it's a wonderful case, the more information that comes out, the more that you shift. So you have the direct evidence of viewing the person. You then hear some other evidence that they have a twin brother. And then you have reason to believe that the twin brother evidence is false. And so you revert back to your original belief that Tom stole the book. And that just seems fine to me. That seems we've weighed up the, the evidence one way and the other. And we've now come to a state where we say, maybe it's possible that there is some twin brother out there, that the mother is a lunatic. And in her lunacy, she forgot that she gave birth to him identical twin and that guy happened to be in town. So I can't say I absolutely know without a shadow of a doubt, but I'm pretty damn sure based on weighing up all the evidence. And isn't that sufficient? So I didn't make the case clear. You never found out that Tom's mother said those things, just like you never found out that those were actually poodles rather than sheep. On the defeasibility view, as long as it's true that those were poodles, there's a defeater for your belief that there are sheep in the field, so you don't know that there are sheep in the field. And at least on the Chisholm-Klein version of defeaters, as long as it's true that Tom's mother said those things, you could also make it Tom's priest, but he's also a lunatic or whatever. As long as it's true that the person said those things, even though the things that they said were false, then there, there would be a true proposition, which if you added just that true proposition to your other evidence, you'd no longer be justified in believing that Tom stole the book. Lehrer and Paxson don't think that the ramblings of a lunatic should block your knowledge. So it's not a matter of you acquiring a new piece of evidence and then getting a defeater for that defeater. It's all done externalistically. As long as there's this true, there's this fact that you're unaware of, that if you were aware of it, you'd no longer be justified, then they say you have a defeater. But maybe I could, I also said, I think you were in the right direction of what the knowledge destroying kind of luck is. In my own work, early work on this, I distinguished two ways in which you could be lucky. Um, you could be evidentially lucky. You could be lucky to have the evidence you do, but given that evidence, it's not at all lucky that your belief turns out to be true. Or um, given your evidence, it's just a matter of luck that the belief turns out to be true. I call that veridic luck. And that's what you were getting at. There's just not a connection between the evidence and the truth of the proposition for which it is evidence. And I think that veridic luck is the kind of luck that is knowledge destroying. Let me just give you an example of evidential luck, where I think pretty much everyone will agree that this is a case of knowledge. So we imagine a bank robber, a bank robbery, and the, the person's in a mask, and the startled teller is shuffling around, collecting the bills, and just happens to glance up for an instant as the robber's mask slips, and she realizes that the bank robber is the bank president. If she had not looked up at just that moment, the mask would have been already pulled up and she wouldn't have had that evidence. But she has that evidence. She saw clearly 
that it was the bank president. She's lucky she looked up when she did. She's lucky she has the visual experience she had. But given that experience, it's not at all lucky that her belief the president was the robber is true. But in these earlier cases, in each of these cases, given your evidence, it looks like the, th those animals look like sheep, but it's just a matter of luck that they're sheep in the field because you're looking at poodles. And so I call that veridic luck because it's a matter of luck that the belief is true. Given your evidence, it's a matter of luck that the belief is true. And I think in pretty much all of the standard cases of knowledge destroying epistemic luck, they have that pattern. You have some body of evidence. The evidence clearly points in one direction, but it's just a matter of luck. Like the evidence is not properly connected to the truth maker. It's just a coincidence that the proposition turns out to be true. Is there a position in the literature? That, that bites the bullet on these cases. So they say, no, there is knowledge. You do know that they're sheep. You do know uh, what the time is in the original Getia case, or I think it's Getia 1. Can you bite the bullet on these cases? Someone could uh, argues that you know in all of these Getia cases, but he's pretty much a lone wolf. This view has not gained any traction whatsoever. There, and if you give people these kinds of examples, let's start with the Dylan case. Person just guesses that the top card is the Jack of Hearts. Pretty much no one thinks, oh, true belief, that's knowledge. That's just a lucky guess. And because, well, let me just say one other thing that philosophers do distinguish between fallible and infallible justification. So infallible justification for P entails the truth of P. So if, you're, if your evidence for P is infallible, then given that evidence, P could not be false. Fallible justification for P makes P probable, but it doesn't entail P. Virtually all contemporary epistemologists are fallibilists because if you think your evidence for to be justified in believing P, your evidence has to entail P, then virtually then we're not justified in any of our empirical beliefs because our evidence is never truth entailing. So think about this case. In the original case, before in the Dylan case, before the card was turned up, Dylan had no evidence that it was the Jack of Hearts. Now the card is flipped over and he sees the Jack of Hearts. Now he's got good visual evidence that's the Jack of Hearts. But that evidence doesn't entail that it's the Jack of Hearts because a, a Cartesian evil demon could have just manipulated his mind as the card was being flipped. It was the two of diamonds, but the evil demon made him perceive the Jack of Hearts. So the fact that he has this visual percept is good evidence that it's the jack of hearts, but it doesn't entail the jack of hearts. And if you make the claim that knowledge requires entailing evidence, then, then it looks like at least with respect to empirical propositions, not cogito type proposition, we wouldn't have any knowledge at all. So I think of the Gettier problem. Many people think of the Gettier problem as what must we add to justify true belief to get knowledge? I actually think of the Gettier problem as the problem of can a fallibilistic epistemology be made to work? Because here's the thing, on any fallibilist account of justification, it's going to be possible to have a justified but false belief. And then you're gonna be, it's gonna also be possible to deduce a true belief from your justified false belief, and you're gonna be justified in the second belief. And now you're gonna have a justified belief that's only luckily true because you deduced it from a justified false belief. So that's going to hold for any fallibilistic theory of justification. And then the question is, can we come up with a condition that blocks this veridic luck that we've been talking about? Yeah, so if I understand your distinction, in the case with the bank robber, you obtain the evidence by luck in that it was lucky that the mask slipped at just the moment that you were looking at the bank robber. But that evidence is good evidence and sufficient to gain knowledge. It seems where there's something 
else that's going on, that it's lucky that it so happens to be the case that it's true, even though your evidence was bad, then we want to discount it. Now, the case that you've, you're implying sounds quite interesting to me, which is that you have a, you have some justification, you have a belief, but it's false. But it leads you to some second belief, which then redirects you to the truth. So through some reasoning process, you're able to work out what the genuine true belief is. But it seems like you're holding two beliefs. The one is a false belief and the other one is a true belief, but they're connected to each other. And so now we've got to work out what is it that you know? Imagine I have a justified false belief that P is a proposition and I deduce the proposition Q from my just validly deduce my belief in Q from my justified false belief that P and coincidentally Q just happens to be true. So on with that standard case, pretty much everyone agrees, well, of course you don't know P because P is false, right? But virtually everyone also agrees that you don't know Q because your evidence wasn't connected to the truth in the right sort of way. You just luckily stumbled upon the, the true proposition Q in these cases. That's the interesting thing. In these cases, you actually have a justified belief that is true, but the overwhelming majority of people think these things fall short of knowledge. Because you're not, knowledge is supposed to be a relation between a knower and the world in some sense. And it has to be, there has to be some kind of conceptual connection between, uh, or some kind of tight connection between the knower and the known, so that it's not just an accident or a coincidence that your belief is true. Yes. Is it not the case? So you say, I believe in P, and if P is true, then Q is true. Turns out Q is true, but P is false. There was another route to get to Q, which was believing in X, and X is actually true. And that's why it turns out that Q is true, because X is a case. But it seems like your justification fails because you've relied on a false premise. And so your belief in Q isn't actually justified because in order to get to Q, you got there through the false premise of P. And so therefore you don't have a justified true belief. Okay, so the original Gettier case was predicated on two assumptions. The first assumption is fallibilism, that S can be just, the kind of justification needed for knowledge is such that S can be, a person S can be justified in believing a proposition even though that proposition turns out to be false. And I think that's our ordinary conception of evidence and justification. Even in the legal system, you can be justified in believing someone's guilty when um, or innocent, let's say, because certain evidence was inadmissible. Uh, you can be justified in believing something's false. Uh, so that's fallibilism. And then the second assumption that Gettier made is that justification is closed through known logical deduction. So if I'm justified in believing that P and I'm justified in believing that P implies Q and I deduce Q, then I'm justified in believing Q. And so he starts out with, a am justified in believing P fallibly. Turns out P is false unbeknownst to me, but I deduce Q from propositions I'm justified in holding. So now I'm justified in believing Q by the justification closure principle. Again, I would say the overwhelming majority of epistemologists working in the field accept both of those two assumptions. And so you actually do get the so-called Gettier problem. And then the challenge is to try to come up with um, a condition that rules out those kinds of cases. So just as justification was supposed to rule out lucky guesses, we now need a, a third, a, a fourth condition that's going to rule out justified beliefs that only luckily turn out to be true or beliefs where the justification isn't properly connected to the truth of the proposition. So as I understand you saying that evidential luck is not a problem, it's fine that it was lucky that the teller looked up just in time to see the mask slip. That doesn't threaten her knowledge that the bank president is the robber. The type of luck that's the problem is a veridic luck where even if she happened to see in time the mask slip, it still wouldn't 
guarantee in the right sorts of ways, or it still wouldn't be linked conceptually in a tight enough way to, to it being the bank robber, being the bank president, that that would threaten knowledge. So veridic luck threatens knowledge, but not epistemic luck. Then a question becomes, in our everyday world, what percentage of our beliefs are affected by the one or the other? I'm inclined to think that almost all of our beliefs are evidentially lucky in the sense that you almost always have to be in the right place at the right time to acquire the relevant evidence, right? You saw the bus go by at such and such a time. If you weren't there, you wouldn't have seen the bus. You wouldn't have had that evidence. You turned on the television and you saw a newscast. If you hadn't turned on the television, you wouldn't have gotten that information. I actually think lucky evidence is just, that's just a part of our daily lives. In fact, I can give you one other example. This is a case, a thought experiment where people in the field are really deeply divided. This is a case from Gilbert Harmon. So Harmon asks us to imagine a situation where a dictator in, in a third world country has been assassinated and the people surrounding the dictator fear a coup. So they want to fabricate a story that the dictator wasn't actually assassinated. One of the dictator's assistants was assassinated and the dictator is now safe and in hiding. But before the fabricated retraction can be made, a reporter uh, who was present saw the assassinate, saw the president get assassinated, threw something together, and got it into a highly reputable afternoon edition of the newspaper. Jane picks up that newspaper and reads the report. All of her assumptions about the newspaper being reliable or accurate. Her assumptions about how the story got into the paper were accurate. And indeed, the story is accurate. So it looks like Jane has a justified true belief that the president has been assassinated. Now, the, the wrinkle is on Harmon's view. Harmon thinks that your knowledge can be destroyed. Now, let me get this. Your knowledge can be destroyed by misleading evidence that you don't possess. In this case, almost everyone else who picked up that newspaper has turned on the TV and seen the retraction. So they don't know what to believe. Was the newspaper writer is the... Re Jane has not turned on the TV. She doesn't have the misleading, undermining evidence. Harmon says that Jane's knowledge was destroyed by misleading evidence she does not possess. I take a different view. I think that her evidence is great. In fact, her evidence is better than if she had turned on the TV. So I think she has evidential luck. Granted, she's lucky she didn't turn on the TV. If she had turned on the TV, she'd be in everyone else's predicament. But I think of that case, she actually knows until she turns on the TV and then finds the, the defeating evidence and now is, is in the same predicament as everybody else. And my sense is that the people who read the Harmon cases are pretty deeply divided. Some think, no, it's just so lucky that you didn't turn on the TV uh, that you shouldn't be credited for knowledge when you could have just as easily been mistaken had you turned on the TV. Um, and other people think until she turns on the TV and gets conflicting evidence, she's being responsible in forming her belief and her evidence is reliable. So she meets the conditions for knowing. In my view, she has evidential luck. She is lucky to be in the evidential situation she is. But given that evidence, it's not at all lucky that the president, that her belief that the president was assassinated is true. On the Harmon view, isn't it the case then that you would never have knowledge? Um, because it's always the case that there's going to be some sort of misinformation possible, even if it's not actually in the world yet at the time when you hold your evidence, or is his view that it has to be in the world, just not available to you yet. But even then, it seems like someone somewhere is going to put out some misinformation, which just hasn't arrived in your inbox yet, which would dissuade you from your belief. I can't say whether it all would always entail that we lack knowledge. He has an epistemic permissibility principle where he says, you're entitled to infer a conclusion only if you are also entitled to infer that there's no misleading evidence that you don't possess. And of course, it's unclear what would justify that latter view, 
right? So it might have more skeptical consequences. I actually haven't thought, I haven't worked through that, so I don't have a definitive view. There might be some fairly simple, straightforward beliefs, like my belief that I have a hand where it's unlikely, where I, it would be reasonable for me to think I don't have any, there's no misleading evidence that I don't possess. But yeah, I think Jason's point is that on things that are widely circulated, they'll often be a counter view. And we now live in a, a time where it's quite hard to say with confidence that you know something to be true. There's a really interesting case going on in South Africa at the moment. There was a Russian ship that docked in Cape Town. It's on the southern tip of Africa. And it was claimed by the American ambassador that the South Africans loaded weapons onto the ship. The One of the South African ministers said there were focal weapons on the ship, which in South African vernacular means there were no weapons on the ship whatsoever. And so now it's quite hard to know. Um, are there weapons on the ship? Are we secretly in league with the Russians? Who do we believe? Uh, and especially the more politicized it is the claim, the more reason you have to have one perspective on it and a contrary perspective on it. Um, and the question is, should you then say we should always be agnostic on anything that's controversial, anything that's uh, the kind of thing where you're going to get two different outlets? Or at some point, do you say, I can confidently say that I know that given my evidence about the actors in the situation, I can say I know. Now we're moving away from epistemic luck and talking about just the degree of justification or evidence that you need for any kind of belief. And without knowing more about the story that you just described and, and what the sources of that knowledge were. So if you told me that the one thing was reported on Fox News media here in the United States, I would think it has a low probability of being true. It's tabloid news. Um, if it were reported on a news network and in several news places that I think are reputable, uh, then that would weigh a certain way. As far as disagreement goes, I think just, this is an aside from our main topic, but uh, I think typically the way, I mean, the media is largely to blame for many of these situations because no matter what, how much consensus there is for a view, they will find one crank who holds the different view, and they'll put them side by side and make the viewer think, oh, it must be, this is deeply undecided, 50-50. Half the experts think this and half the experts think that, like climate change, which of course, that's not at all the case. Uh, there's overwhelming evidence of climate change. So I, I think that you need media literacy to discern when you're being manipulated and what reliable sources of information are. But I grant you, once you go down the rabbit hole, of misinformation, it's hard to come out, right? Because you just, you, you get into an epistemic bubble, all of the people reinforce your misguided views. So, and I think you become invested in those views, so you don't actually have a reason to go out and try to see if you're mistaken. Whereas I think we should always be looking for counter evidence, no matter how well supported our views are. That's just part of what it is to be an intellectually honest inquirer. But that's just something about like how to reason well and doesn't directly impinge on our on the question of epistemic luck, at least and if it does, I'm missing uh, how that hooks up. So I'm trying to I'm trying to push a hole through this, this distinction between evidential luck and verdict luck. And I want to go back to the original case. So the case of Dylan and, and the card playing. So Dylan guesses the, I can't remember what it was, Jack of Hearts. Uh, yeah, yes. Jack of Hearts. He loves the Jack of Hearts. So he's guessing the Jack of Hearts. And just so happens that the card that is pulled out the top of the deck is the Jack of Hearts. Why isn't he also, why isn't he evidentially lucky there? Why is it only verdict luck? It seems when you describe evidential luck as being in the right place at the right time to receive evidence, it seems like he's at the right place at the right time. He is there when the deck is shuffled in a certain way. If he'd been there, during a different shuffle, it'd be different. That seems not so different to the way we phrase what's happening in the bank robber case. What I would say about the Dylan case is that he has no evidence as to what the card is. He just is fond of the Jack of Hearts. That's not any 
reason to think the Jack of Hearts is the top card. And the reason I would not call that evidential luck is with, with evidential luck, you're lucky to have the evidence you do, but given that evidence, it's not at all lucky that the belief turns out to be true. But I don't think that Dylan has any evidence that the card is the Jack of Hearts. So I wouldn't call that evidential luck. Uh, yeah. So what I'm thinking about is the way I've given the Gettier type cases to non-philosophers in the past. And, and I'll say to them, okay, so here's the case, and this is why I trust about true belief isn't knowledge. And they'll say to me, but it turns out that you guessed the time of the clock correctly, right? It turns out that Dylan got the card right. So it's almost like they want to say that evidence is not necessarily justification, evidence or justification are not necessarily in the mind of the subject holding the proposition that we say is or isn't knowledge. And Harmon, I think, is trying to get at that. So Harmon is saying that the mind of Jane, who, who do, hasn't yet received the falsified uh, news reports, the mind of Jane isn't what's important when we consider whether Jane is justified in believing what she does. What's more important is the circumstance. The circumstance matters, the, the state of the world, the state of all the evidence in the world. And a lot of people who are not philosophers, I think, subscribe to the view that if something happens, and I believed it would have, that it would happen, and it did happen, and I believed correctly, then after the fact, we can say I had evidence for it happening purely because it did. I may not even know why. So they'll say there's some subconscious belief, or there's, some, there's something going on that isn't available to the subject at the time, but the mere fact that they guessed correctly. I think this is this comes up in, in lottery winners. So when someone wins the lottery, there's obviously no evidence at the time when they choose their numbers, right? They have no evidence and they've, they've cheated the lottery that those numbers are going to be the correct numbers. Zero evidence. But it's a common lay view that there was evidence that they were going to win the lottery. After the fact, once they did win the lottery, we say, yeah, you know, they were somehow justified in winning that lottery. And I'm not saying that this lay view is correct. It's not correct. But why is it that so many people believe this? Are so many people just deluded? Or is there some parallel view on justification that they're trying to get at, that they're not quite grasping correctly? I actually have doubts that most people have the view that you just described, that people think that they're justified in believing their ticket will win when it has a one in 13 million chance of losing, uh, of winning. That would be a pretty absurd belief. I think they, they uh, feel justified after do... they win. So after they win. So not before, but after they right. win, they think retrospectively, I was justified. I think it would be a strange thing to say after they win, I knew I was going to win. Because on, on what basis? You, 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 you had almost no chance of winning. You had a one in 13 million chance of winning, and you had no reason to think that your numbers would be the numbers that, that were drawn rather than any of the other combinations. Sometimes people say things. Also, we have to be careful. Sometimes people will say, uh, suppose the Cubs win the World Series. Someone might say, I knew they were going to win. At the beginning of the season, I knew they were going to win. But no, the chances of any team winning at the beginning of the season are no matter how good they are because of the possibilities of injuries and this, that, and the other. I think at a certain point, you, I will grant you that the, the, the lowest common denominator where somebody is inclined, is inclined to use the word no is mere true belief. People say, well, you got it. Okay. For our, in our context, that's good enough. But I think, think about that. One of the reasons we care about knowledge is the role that knowledge plays in assertion. So if you assert the party starts at eight o'clock, I ask you, when does the party start? And you say it starts at eight o'clock. I'm assuming that you wouldn't have told me it starts at eight o'clock unless you knew it starts at eight o'clock, because if I arrive at the wrong time, that would be really inconvenient. So one of the views is that the norm of assertion, it knowledge is the norm of assertion. You should not flat out assert P 
if you don't know that P is the case. If you don't know, you should hedge. You should say, I think it's at eight, but you better call the, the host to make sure. Instead, but if you say it's at eight, you're representing yourself as knowing that it's at eight. And if I go to the party and it's at eight, but I find out that you just guessed and I changed all of my plans just to be there at eight, even if it worked out, I'd be really upset that you represented yourself as knowing that it was eight when you had no idea, you just threw a time out there. One of the reasons knowledge is important is because of the role it plays in transmitting information to other people. That's a very good case. Would someone be upset if I guessed the time, told you the time, you change your plans, you arrive, turns out to be the correct time. I don't think that person would be upset. I think what they'd say is they'd reformulate their belief that you didn't know. So, so if you said to them, I, I actually didn't know, I just guessed, they'd say to you, no, I, th I think you probably had some reason. Maybe you didn't have all the reasons in the world, but you had decent reason to tell me it was eight be because it turned out to be eight. I think humans are very wedded to what actually happens. This is a, a discussion that I have a lot with Mark because I'm a probabilistic utilitarian. The probabilistic utilitarian says when action's right, just in case I have sufficient reason at the time or the agent has sufficient reason at the time to think that it will result in the best outcome, as opposed to some sort of actual utilitarianism, which says that an action's right just in case the consequences that actually ensue are the right ones. And we see this all the time in politics, all the time. When a politician comes up with a view that just so happens to lead to the best outcome, they'll claim that they'll claim one account of knowledge that, well, I knew it and it was right because my policy was right because it ensued. What, what I said would happen, happened, and it was the best outcome. But then when the best outcome doesn't, doesn't happen, they'll say, I went off the evidence I had at the time, and that was the right decision, even if it turned out to be wrong. No one could have foreseen that. So it, it does seem like context seems to really matter sometimes, and at other times it's what really happens that we count as evidence that we... So I'm phrasing this in, a, in very unclear ways, but what I'm trying to get is that humans seem to really care about what actually happens. I agree with that, but th there's sometimes you bring in notions of evidence, like you brought in evidence and then it turns out the belief was false. In some sense, the evidence, you're blameless for having asserted what you did because you had evidence. So the evidence is playing some kind of exculpatory role. But let's think about this case. You tell your partner, honey, I want you to go out and buy the most expensive car there is. I want you to buy tickets for this cruise. I want you to buy a, a, a vacation home in so-so. And so she goes out and spends all this money or he goes out and spends all this money. And, and then says, how can we afford this? And you say, I'm going to win the lottery. <laughs> I think your partner would be furious that that they had gone out and spent all this money because you don't know you're going to win the lottery. Even if you the lottery, this person would think, how can you take such risks? I already spent all this money. That, that was just unbelievably reckless of you to tell me to go spend this money. There's no way you knew your ticket was going to win. I think that would be the reaction. I don't think somebody said, oh, great. Yeah, th thanks for that advice. I'm glad we went, bought all these things. I would I'll agree that if you interview college freshmen who haven't actually thought very much about what knowledge is and how the word no is properly used, you can get all kinds of different sorts of views. But my experience teaching this stuff is that when you present them with a typical Gettier case, they really don't consider those to be instances of knowledge. So I'll give you a couple of cases around liability and knowledge in the law. So you are confronted in a dark alley by someone. He, you see a, like the light gleaming off his pistol. And before he gets a chance to shoot you, you take out your pistol and you shoot him. Okay. And you say, so justified self-defense. It was the right thing for me to have done. He could have taken my life unless I shot him. You then inspect the body and you look at the pistol and it's a, a replica. So there's no bullets inside the pistol. He couldn't have killed you. Ex post factum, after the fact, that you had no justification. 
but you had a justification at the time because it was reasonable for you to believe that it was a threat to your life. Second case, you get very drunk at a party and you decide to drive yourself home. Now, it's reasonable to believe that a drunk person driving themselves home could very well collide into another car or into a pedestrian and kill them. You just happen to be lucky in that you don't. And so you get home safely and no one is harmed. And so it seems like whether we care about real-world consequences or knowledge has these big effects. So Jason's going to want to say, well, it doesn't matter whether you kill the toddler on your way home or whether you don't. We just have to look at what the probabilities were at the time, and the probabilities were identical. You're just lucky there was no toddler in the road. So we should throw you in jail as if you murdered someone. And the actual utilitarian is going to say, well, you killed an innocent person in the first case. They didn't actually have bullets in their gun. We should punish you. And so it seems like we want to have a consistent account of what constitutes knowledge, when it matters, whether it's reasonable to believe things at the time, or whether we should take into account the effects that as they become fully known. Well, so you've introduced cases of moral luck as opposed to epistemic luck. The, the moral luck case about the drunk driver, in some sense, is just lucky that didn't hit somebody. You have two drunk drivers. They're both the same level of alcohol in their blood. One, one hits a person, another one doesn't. And we hold the person who hit the person. Even if we think both are criticizable, we, there are much greater penalties for the person who kills a person while they're drunk and uh, versus the person who, in a sense, got away with it, didn't have the bad consequences. That's moral luck, not epistemic luck. In the first case, I think that you had, uh, you were as long as that replica looked like an, a real gun, indistinguishable from uh, a real gun, and it looked like that person was going to shoot you or shoot an innocent person, um, that you were indeed epistemically justified in believing that was a gun and epistemically justified in believing that person was a threat to someone and that you needed to intervene in some sort of serious way uh, to pre prevent them from harming somebody else. Um, and I think think that we don't say, after the fact, you didn't have evidence. It's just the evidence was misleading. Uh, but it might be of interest to the listeners to look at, hear what some of the purported attempts to, to block veridic luck are. There are two widely discussed modal attempts to, uh, to, to block um, epistemic luck. One is called sensitivity, a sensitivity condition, and one is called safety. With the sensitivity condition, a belief, S is belief that P, where P is a proposition and S is the believer, S is belief that P is sensitive if and only if S would not have believed P if P were false. Okay, now let's think about the sheep in the field example. I still would have believed there were sheep in the field, even if there weren't sheep on the other side of the hill, on the basis of the poodles that I'm looking at. So my belief was not sensitive to the truth, so it falls short of knowledge. I still would have believed that either Jones owns a Ford or Brown is in Barcelona, even if Brown weren't in Barcelona, on the basis of my evidence that Jones owns a Ford. So in each one of these cases, it looks like my belief was not sensitive, and that's why that's trying to get a modal connection between the belief and the truth of the target proposition. So the, the downside, there are two downsides to sensitivity. Uh, one is you get closure failure. For example, my belief that I have a hand is sensitive. If I didn't have hands, I wouldn't believe I did go to the worlds closest to our own where I don't have hands and either I was born without them or I lost them in an accident and I don't believe I have hands in those worlds. My, I know I have hands because my belief that I have hands is sensitive to the truth. Um, but I don't know that I'm not a handless brain in a vat. Bring up your name of your podcast, right? Why? Because if I were a handless brain in a vat, being fed all the same information that I'm currently being fed, I would believe I'm not a handless brain in a vat. And so that now I know I have hands, but I don't know I'm not handless brain in a vat. So you get uh, abominable conjunctions like that and you get closure failure because if I know I have hands, that entails I'm not a handless brain in a vat. 
but I, I know that I have hands on the sensitivity view, but I don't know I'm not a handless brain in a bat. So some people are a little, don't really like closure failure. It seems if I actually know P and knowledge is factive and P entails Q and I deduce Q, then I ought to know Q because once it's factive and you just have a logical entailment, that logical entailment entails that it guarantees that Q is true. And there's a second worry about sensitivity, that sensitivity is too strong, that it's, we don't, our beliefs don't have to be sensitive. So Jonathan Vogel gives an example of hole in one. I tell it as follows. There's a, there's a really difficult par three hole in Augusta National where the, the Masters Golf Tournament is played. The hole is called Flowering Crab Apple. It's a 240 yard par three hole. And in 2007, not a single player shot a hole in one on that hole in four rounds of play. So I think that I know right now that not every player will shoot a hole in one on that hole in the first round of play this year. But of course, if every player were to shoot a hole in one on that hole this year in defiance of the astronomical odds against it, I would still believe they weren't going to shoot that everyone wasn't going to shoot a hole in one in the first round of play. So my belief is not sensitive, yet Vogel, and I think he's right, insists that I still know that's just not going to happen. Those kinds of things, if you watch enough sports, that's not going to happen. I know it's not going to happen, even though the belief is not sensitive. So the next modal condition that people have put forward is a condition called safety. So with sensitivity, the question is, if P were false, would you believe P? That was sensitivity. With safety, the question is, were you to believe P, would P be true? Okay, so what's the difference? With safety, you look at all the nearby worlds where you believe P and see if P is false in any of those worlds. With sensitivity, you go out to the first not P world and see if you still believe P in the not P world. And that not P world might be really a distant world, like the world where I'm a handless brain in a bat is a really distant world. So while my belief that I'm not a handless brain in a bat is not sensitive, presumably it is safe. As long as things are anything like we think they are, there's no nearby world where I'm a handless brain in a bat. You have to get out to a pretty far-fetched science fiction. So a lot of people have gone with safety as a way of blocking veridic luck, such that as long as as long as P would be true if you believed it, then you have the right kind of modal connection to the truth of the proposition. And so those are two ways that people have tried to come up with a condition that eliminates knowledge-destroying veridic luck.